Hi, everyone, and welcome. I am Serena Mohan. I'm the Director of Public Programming and Events at the Preservation Resource Center. Um, thank you all so much for coming to the second installment of um, the, I don't remember what the exact title is, the History of uh, New Orleans Architecture and Neighborhoods um, with Michelle Duhon. Um, this is going to be an awesome conversation about uh, late 19th century and um, 20th century architecture up through about the middle uh, mid-century um, and for those of you who were here last week you sort of know what the what the drill is but let me just refresh everyone um, all of the um, audience and participants that are in the zoom webinar and watching from the zoom platform um, you should have no video and you'll be muted but that doesn't mean that you can't participate in the conversation. So Michelle and I are here. We're having a conversation. You can see both of us on screen. You can see Michelle's uh, presentation. But you are welcome to ask questions using your chat function. There's also a Q&A button. Um, we're generally not using that. So uh, if you want to just send us questions in chat, um, if Michelle doesn't see them, I'll be reading questions out as we go. If I know something's going to come up later, we may sort of wait on that question. Um, so don't be concerned if we don't ask it right when you um, send it in. Um, but if you are watching on Facebook Live, you can't necessarily participate um, in the in the chat function. So if you would like to participate in future um, online classes, please register. Um, I also just want to take one moment to um, thank our members. Uh, members of the Preservation Resource Center are um, so important to us. You guys are how we make this possible. Um, this free programming is um, its super fun for us. We hope it's fun for you guys and helpful for you guys in knowing and loving your historic buildings. Um, not just now during this time when we're all home and in them all the time, but um, every day. And so if you are not yet a member of the PRC, please consider joining. Um, really our members sustain us um, and if you are interested there are other ways that you can give back to the PRC we have incredible merchandise available on our website including t-shirts we also have a wonderful coffee table book um, titled building on the past that is uh, just a wonderful it, it's beautiful amazing photos of historic buildings but also it really tells the story of how these buildings are saved and what that means for our city um, if you have any questions about anything please feel free at any time like I said to um, ask them via chat. If you have questions after this, um, I'm available by email, smohan at prcno.org. Um, and I am going to hand it over to Michelle, um, who is our incredible historic building expert. She is the founder of um, Bayou Preservation and South Kick LLC. She does amazing preservation work on um, historic buildings, um, private residences, large scale buildings. She also is an incredible expert on cemetery re uh, restoration. Um, she knows more about building materials than anyone I know. Um, she's an incredible resource in this and she's gonna share some of what she knows about our historic neighborhoods and architecture now. Thanks, Michelle. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, Serena, just a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds great. Great, and I'm gonna hide the video panel. So you should be able to see my full presentation now, correct? Yep. Great. That's good. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. If you were here last week for part one of the uh, historic house specialist presentation. This is this slide that you see now in front of you. This is where we're picking up in our timeline. We kind of stopped in the middle of our historic architectural styles last week. So but I'm going to actually take us back a couple of slides to see where we left off. Um, so last week we wrapped up talking about different styles within the Victorian period. And again, I'm gonna repeat this because it's a pet peeve of mine. Victorian is not an architectural style, it's a period. Within the Victorian period, we have many different types of styles. So last week we left off talking about this one. This is the East Lake Bracket style. We talked about this, the Queen Anne Free Classic, <clears throat> excuse me, and we talked about this, Richardsonian Romanesque. Now, just some major themes to review from these different types of styles. You can see that they all have different levels of, um, we'll say masculinity and femininity. The Richardson Richardsonian Romanesque before you being a very heavy, masculine style, 
Queen Anne Free Classic being a bit more feminine, a bit more light and airy, but drawing on obviously um, some classical examples of architecture with those columns. And then the East Lake Bracket style being a little sillier. Um, <laughs> we have all these curved millworks. You know, if we go even further back, we get, woo, we get to this, the Blue Lady, which is also Queen Anne. Um, just kind of silliness extra. So keeping all that in mind, that's where we left off. Now we're about to jump into the early 20th century and we're gonna jump into revival styles. Within the early 20th century, the city of New Orleans itself is expanding outwards greatly. We're um, filling in, <coughs> excuse me, we're filling in our canals that had been dug earlier. We've long ago left using bayous as, and those waterways as modes of transportation. So now we're going to be looking at the Old Lake View, Mid-City, Carrollton, Gentilly, Broadmoor, all those areas. So let's jump in. All right, this is our colonial revival style. Excuse me. Colonial revival. So what are we looking at? This is clearly referencing East Coast American architecture. Um, it's showing a revived interest in our American history. And the big thing that I want to show you here, this is kind of the antithesis to that other Victorian era architecture, which had more of an emphasis on excess. Here we see emphasis more on uh, symmetry, some classical things. We've got our Palladian windows, which is, let me use my pointer here. Here we go. This Palladian window. Um, some, a lot of these examples will have fan lights, swan neck elements, classical columns, which we have here. These are some nice Doric columns. Uh, typically, we, we've got some shutters going on and typically two stories in this kind of architecture. Again, this is just our time of turning away from all that excess, all that color, all the bizarre furniture references that we saw in the Victorian era architecture. Ah. This is one of my personal favorite styles of the early 20th century. This is the Tudor Revival. Now, this is also showing a renewed interest in America's colonial past, and specifically its English-inspired architecture. Now, this is being built, obviously, the early 20th century, very popular in the 1920s and 1930s. And this is using or excuse me, it's referencing rather something called half timbering. You see that right in here. This is not real half timbering. This is um, fake half timbering. <laughs> in medieval England, they would actually use giant wooden beams like this with infill of essentially a line based render as structural as a structural system. This is just merely a veneer. It's a reference of a much older building type. You've also got, and this picture is a little unclear, I'm sorry about that, these little teeny tiny diamond shaped muttons with these little bitty panes of glass. Again, that's referencing a much, much older style of building. Originally in medieval England, they could only make little teeny tiny pieces of glass, and that's why they had so many muttons. We're well into the 20th century now. We know how to make large panes of glass. We're choosing not to. We're choosing to reference something much older here. Um, also referencing Northern European roots with this. You see this very steeply pitched roof. Those are designed to, set, to shed snow which we don't have a lot of here in New Orleans. So again, 
I love this style. It's just kind of quirky. In New Orleans especially, it stands out. Um, specifically because this was a style used so heavily in the 1920s and 1930s. And in the South, it was really used um, after the crash, so post-1928. Because of that, you don't see it a lot in New Orleans. You do see it a lot in other cities in the South that fared a little bit better during the Depression. But we don't have a lot of examples of this here. Um, Quick check in, Serena. Do we have any questions? Yep. Um, we just got a question um, asking if you can tell us where you mostly see Tudor revival um, houses or uh, properties in New Orleans. You're going to see them mostly in the Fountain Blue and Broadmoor neighborhoods here. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about. This is called the neoclassical revival style. And that's a silly name, isn't it? We'll get into that. Um, we're still in the early 20th century. This is a style that ends, I have 1920 here, but you can kind of just imagine 1920 dot, dot, dot. The style kept going a little bit longer than that in New Orleans. Now this name. Neoclassical revival. I want you to almost read that backwards. So revival, when we're talking about architectural styles, means we're bringing something back. Neo means new. Classical, referencing old. So read this name backwards. Bringing back an old thing in a new way. That's what this style is essentially trying to do. And how is it doing that? Well, we see the classical references, right? We've got columns and they, they've got nice little simple details. We have an entablature above those columns, also pretty simple. And it has more or less the three parts of a classical entablature. But that's kind of it um, for our classicism here. No Greek or Roman would ever dare build something like this. These columns, first of all, are much too far apart for any proper Greek or Roman. They're also much too skinny to be holding up this large entablature. So that's why it's a new interpretation of something that is old, neoclassical. Another calling card of this style, specifically in New Orleans, is the use of art glass within these windows. Now, this is art glass, not stained glass. Stained glass and art glass are two different materials made two different ways. Art glass is recognizable because it's got not only all these color variations, but within one pane of glass, it's got color variation. Stained glass, because of the way it's made, is going to have a consistent color within each pane of glass. Stained glass is also we're going, to, going to require the use of lead. Art glass here does not. These are traditional wood window muttons surrounding each pane. Art glass is beautiful. You can still buy it. Um, it's still being made. It's a wonderful material. Uh, what else are we working with here? Ah, yes. The neoclassical revival in general is representing a return to linear and rectangular forms. We are turning away again and continuously away from all of those curves and textures and extra details that we saw in our Victorian, uh, Victorian era architecture. And I get this question a lot, where does paint fit into these architectural styles? We saw with the Victorian era architecture, we saw a lot of color, a lot of dark colors, especially very earthy, very muted, um, but they really did use the entire spectrum. Neoclassical revival, they loved white paint. So if you get a building of this style and you know, you hear a lot about, oh, is it ever appropriate to use white paint in New Orleans? New Orleans is such a colorful city. 
this is a style that always historically paired with white paint. So it's very appropriate to use it here. And the white paint kind of lets your art glass really um, shine. All right, any questions, Serena? Um, I think that's, that's it for now. Okay, let me keep going. Okay, um, this is another really fun style. The early 20th century just gets so, so interesting. This is the mission revival style. Some people just call it mission style. Uh, again, early 20th century architecture still. This has a very short run though, especially in New Orleans, but it's pretty easily distinguished because it's got this Alamo shaped parapet. That's its big calling card. Now, what is this parapet doing and where did this come from? This is referencing Spanish missions, specifically the Alamo. Now, the funny thing about that, the Alamo itself was a very basic little rectangle building. It never, ha it never originally had this. Of course, we all think of the Alamo as this is its thing, right? This is the first thing you think of when you think of the Alamo out in Texas. This was not original to the Alamo. A German architect in the late part of the 19th century was tasked with restoring the Alamo and his big task was to figure out how to add a pitched roof. He couldn't figure out how to add a pitched roof to the Alamo without also figuring out a way to hide it. So this picture shows us, whoop, where's my, there it is. Behind this parapet, you can see this pitched roof. It comes up like there and goes down on that side which is great, pitch roofs work really well here. And this parapet, which actually comes from Dutch and German traditions, is doing a great job of hiding that roof line. So this thing, this kind of parapet shape, got added to the Alamo, and then a few decades later, other parts of the country start building buildings to look like the Alamo. And what do they do? Well, they stick these parapets on their buildings as well. So I want you next time you see one of these parapets, think to yourself, oh, that's a mission revival building, early 20th century architecture. But oh, how silly. It's using this thing that was never part of Spanish architecture. It came from this kind of crazy Dutch German tradition and a questionable renovation. Um, something that this style does show us in general, though, is that Americans are starting to turn west for architectural inspiration. We're not just looking east anymore. Remember, all through the Victorian era period, or excuse me, the Victorian era, and even with that colonial revival architecture that we talked about just a few slides ago, in Tudor revival, we're, we were continuously looking east to New England, English, Northern Europe examples. Now, as we get into the 1920s, we are looking West. Quick question, Michelle, just going back to, sorry, going back two slides to the yes. neoclassical revival. Um, someone just wanted you to, to, to sort of touch on, um, they asked if that is a double shotgun. Um, can you also just use this as an opportunity to sort of reiterate, I think you made this point last time about sort of how these different styles apply to the different forms? Sure, that's a great question. So yes, this is a double shotgun, a very traditional example of it. You, this is a, oh, there we are, a four bay. So you have a door, window, window door. You would have a demising wall separating the two units right down the middle behind this middle column. And a double shotgun is a type of house form. It's not necessarily a style. Um, you can apply any style of architecture to the form of a double shotgun. And it, again, a lot of these styles, neoclassical revival in particular, were applied to both really grand buildings, 
but also to really kind of more humble buildings like a double shotgun. You know, this isn't, this isn't a St. Charles Avenue mansion that we're looking here. Um, double shotguns is, you know, is what the everyday, the normal people lived in. So some other forms of architecture that we've talked about. In fact, we just left one. There it is. Um, yep, Mission Revival. This is mostly a high style example. You don't see a lot of this being applied to a double shotgun. Uh, I can't think of a single example actually. Um, and usually that's because you need the massing of the building. You need two story structures usually, and you wanna pair all of this, you know, this large fancy parapet. You wanna make sure that you've got the arches below, you've got other elements to complement it. But neoclassical revival, this is easy, right? This can be applied simply to just a front porch and then behind all this, you just have a nice little rectangle of a double building, or a double shotgun, excuse me. Any other questions? Yep, we have a few more questions about neoclassical revival before we move back forward. Um, so um, one person would like to know how you tell the difference between colonial revival and neoclassical revival. Great, so let's see. Here's my colonial revival. And here's my neoclassical revival. So the first thing I would look for, these, this art glass with these diamond muttons, you will never see that on colonial revival architecture. That's a calling card of neoclassical revival. Also colonial revival, where'd we go? They love these dormers up in the roof line. Colonial Revival is mostly going to be these two-story structures. Not always, but usually. And coming down here, whoop, we've got side lights around our door and a large transom. That's a very popular Colonial Revival element. Shutters are big on Colonial Revival. Neoclassical Revival, much more pared down. The emphasis is really on this porch and these columns holding up this classical entablature. Neoclassical Revival, I would say, is usually a bit simpler than our Colonial Revival. Um, Follow-up question. Can, yep. Follow up question to that. Can you can you speak a little bit about what front doors would be appropriate on um, someone's asking specifically about neoclassical revival structures? Yes, let's see. So within New Orleans, this is a perfectly appropriate kind of front door. You will also see a lot of neoclassical revival structures that have the double doors or very skinny French doors that fit into really a three foot or 42 inch opening, um, but two doors. And they'll still have pane over panel, meaning a pane of glass in the top half or even in the top two thirds over a panel below. Sorry, I keep losing my cursor, there it is. You know, so a panel on a neoclassical revival door could come up higher, but you see this nice little sill element here and then this glass pane, you know, if there's two doors, meaning they're divided down the middle here, this glass pane could get much skinnier and smaller. Um, I would say the double door or the French door example is probably what you see even more often in New Orleans. And there's a great book out there. If you are ever, you know, staring at a building, trying to figure out what style it is, and you're trying to like really look at particular elements like doors and windows and dormers. Um, it's called A Field Guide to America's Houses. It's by Virginia McAllister, a noted preservationist who just passed away, unfortunately. And it is a phenomenal resource. So I highly recommend that. Any other questions, Serena? Yep, actually back to the colonial revival um, okay. houses. Someone's actually asking a really interesting question about um, New Orleans climate. So you see the, a lot of these houses um, in the Northeast. And so they're asking if this is appropriate for New Orleans climate 
um, or if the uh, really if the interiors have ever been, have been altered in some way to fit here. Uh, there's be, like asking specifically about the ceiling height in these houses. Great. Um, so ceiling heights in New Orleans are traditionally pretty tall and we are between 10 and 12 feet. Sometimes in high style buildings, they get even taller. What New Orleans does to kind of modify specifically this style for its climate, we add wraparound porches and you can see one here. This one actually, I don't know if, no, it doesn't look like it wraps around, but this is a pretty large porch. If you were to find this building actually up in New England, a lot of times it wouldn't have this front porch at all. It would just be the structure and then it might have a little inset front door to shield it from the, the cold weather. New Orleans is also going to have, and you kind of see a hint of it up here, it's going to have a lot of sleeping porches attached to these kinds of buildings. That would traditionally be surrounded up by windows on three sides. Sorry, I keep losing my little, here we go. So this, if it had windows on all three sides of it, that's indicative of a historic sleeping porch. By putting windows on all sides, they could load the beds up in that little space and get maximum air circulation. New Orleans also, I mean, we've got windows, you know, as many windows as we can fit. These would be either single hung or double hung windows where you could really open a sash maybe even lower the top sash so that you're letting that hot air out of the top and the cool air in through the bottom. But all of these are still being built, you know, good 20, 20 to 30 years before we're introducing air conditioning into anything, into any residences anyway. So we're working with natural breezes and circulating air. Um, I think that's all of the questions so far about colonial revival and neoclassical revival, but we do have a few questions about the mission style. If you're Great. Ready. Let's see. Great. Um, so one question is, are the walls made from stucco or plaster? And then also where can we find mission style buildings in New Orleans? So mission style buildings, you're going to see mostly in the Broadmoor, Fountain Blue areas. Um, there's maybe a couple of random examples throughout Uptown. Now, to that question of is this stucco or plaster? Oh, that's just my favorite question so far. In America, we call exterior plaster stucco. We call interior plaster plaster. They're both made similarly, but one's exterior, one's interior. However, I'm here to tell you Exterior plaster is only stucco when it's done in Italy. Stucco is the champagne of plaster. Just like champagne can only really come from Champagne, France, stucco technically is only stucco when it comes from Italy. The proper term for exterior plaster is render. Americans do not use that term typically. The English Canadians, most other places in the world would call this render. In America, we will call it stucco though. It's just not really correct. Um, that's okay. Now, I could go on all day about the composition differences or, or, or excuse me, similarities between plasters and stuccos and mortars, etc. In, so we're still in the early 19, or excuse me, early 20th century here. By this time, we have started to introduce Portland cement to our plasters, our renders, and our stuccos. Portland cement, which is kind of a four-letter word in the historic preservation community, began to be manufactured in the United States in 1875, and it pretty quickly gained popularity so that by the time We've got 1890 as our start date here. By the time this building is being constructed, I can almost guarantee you that this old render or stucco has Portland cement in it. Before that, it was all lime based and New Orleans really 
outside of the French Quarter wasn't using a whole lot of lime-based renders on private residences. That changes, again, with the introduction of Portland cement. Portland cement makes your stuccos or your renders uh, dry faster, dry harder, it's more brittle, it's got more salts in it. There's a whole slew of benefits, uh, pros and cons, if you will, to this material, but it drastically changes architecture in the United States. Any other questions? Nothing yet. Great. Okay. Uh, we're going to keep moving. Okay. Spanish eclectic. Uh, we're getting now kind of towards the mid, uh, excuse me, mid 20th century. We're really dealing between the two world wars here. Um, you know, if my husband had one house style that he could just go by and have his choosing, it would be this, the Spanish eclectic style. You see these really through Uptown, Fountain Blue, Broadmoor, really even up into a little bit of Old Lakeview. Um, within New Orleans, the calling cards here, this nice big, very grand entrance, the stairway. The house is raised. A lot of times these style of houses have those little basement apartments underneath them. Another distinguishing characteristic, these roof tiles, which are often glazed. In New Orleans, we have examples of bright blues and greens and even um, kind of some pink colors out there. Uh, also, you know, we've got these nice big arches, very Romanesque. And this one brings in some little other details like these nice uh, brackets. Uh, deep overhangs, too, on these roof lines. Spanish eclectic, beautiful, beautiful style. Um, all of these details that we're looking at are really being borrowed from the entire history of Spanish architecture. This, this isn't referencing one time or place within Spanish history. And it's... I, I really like this style of architecture personally. I think it's very interesting. And again, also this is an example of us looking more west to our Spanish heritage that we, at least in this time, associated with California, Texas, and the western part of the United States and bringing those traditions into our local architecture rather than solely looking east. So yeah. Michelle, you, you mentioned basement apartments and um, there was a question earlier um, that I think can be sort of brought into a lot of these different, um, different styles. Um, someone was asking sort of about uh, climate resilience and water management in our architecture. Um, the question specifically related to sort of when New Orleans um, stopped elevating properties as a response to or as a, as a resilience tool. Um, but I think that that can also be applied to sort of when they started raising them, where they were raising them and to what level. Um, so would would an apartment like that have been an original feature um, or would this property have been raised? And can you kind of speak to that with these different styles and the locations of the neighborhoods where we're seeing them pop up? Um, also with reference to sort of the, uh, our drainage uh, techniques and technologies. Yeah, so that's a big question and that, that could be a presentation all on its own really. Um, New Orleans buildings were and are traditionally raised, it, let's say anywhere between 30 inches to 48 inches above ground. When you build new construction today in New Orleans, you do still have to raise your building or you at least have to prove that you are above the base flood elevation. That's usually going to put your finished floor level at around 36 inches above grade. And that kind of goes with what you see when you're driving around town in any of our historic districts. You see houses that are raised and they've got maybe five to six steps leading up to the front door. Now, with the introduction of the automobile, 
and really in the early 20th century, in New Orleans anyway, and as we start expanding into neighborhoods that require an automobile in order to get from, let's say you're now living in Lakeview or Gentilly or even parts of Mid-City, um, you know, th this automobile, the, the use of the automobile changes our architecture. There are buildings that are built, some within this Spanish eclectic style, others, let's see if I can find one. Um, I've actually worked on one that was a Tudor revival that had a raised basement underneath it. A lot of these buildings are originally built with garages underneath them. And that works, right? You can safely house a car that is at or under the flood elevation level because you can move a car. After a few years, decades, a lot of people say, well, my garage hasn't flooded as long as I've been here. Let's fill it in. Let's make it an apartment or let's just reclaim the space as usable and livable square footage. That tends not to go very well. Um, I can't tell you how many houses I've worked on that have had garages converted into basement apartments or they've converted basement storage areas into living square footage that simply just flood. And I'll tell you, the bad one was, what was it, August of 2016 or was it 2017? I can't even remember now. Um, when we had that big flood, in mid city and I was working on a house very similar to the Spanish eclectic style that had a raised basement that was never intended to be finished, but previous owners had finished it out and man, it flooded so quick. It got about eight inches of water in it, which was just enough to kind of get into the electrical, get into the insulation and everything. So we could, again, this is a much bigger topic we could go on and on about, but New Orleans houses traditionally were raised. Now they're still being raised. They should be raised. Basement apartments tend to not work here. Any follow-ups to that? Um, I don't see any follow-ups to that just yet. Um, we do have some other questions. We actually have a few questions that have come up in the past few minutes about render. Oh, great. Um, so, um, Someone is asking if you can tell, uh, tell us about the South Carolina or Georgia process of putting oyster shells into render. Oh, yes. That's called tabby, that material. Um, so along the Atlantic coast, they used oyster shells. They would burn them. The oyster shells, which are essentially made from the same thing as limestone, uh, calcium carbonate, would get burned they would create a powder and this became your lime. Lime is used in so many different ways. It can be used in our plasters, our renders, our stuccos, et cetera. And um, along the East Coast, once they had burned the shells and created the lime, they would use other local materials to essentially create like, um, <laughs> they would put it into formwork and create blocks out of it, building blocks. And then they would actually use whole oyster shells embedded within the powder form of the oyster as aggregate. So just like we use rocks in our concrete today, they would use oyster shells. This was extremely, extremely popular um, along the East Coast. Not used here. Um, tabby is a little bit more susceptible to humidity and water damage. Um, it's not, so not used here and, oh, my other thought just left me, um, shells. Ah, it comes from more of a Spanish tradition, whereas our earliest buildings and Tabby's at like a, a 1700s building material. Our earliest buildings at that point were more from the French. So Tabby's a phenomenal building material. I encourage anybody who's interested to research it. 
We don't have it here. It is an East Coast building material. Another vendor question. Um, someone's asking um, if Portland cement contains lime, um, and if not, is that a problem? Um, yes and no. <laughs> Portland cement contains lime, alumina, silica, and iron oxide. All those materials are combined and burnt at a very high temperature to create Portland cement. But we never use the term Portland cement synonymously with lime. Lime is a, lime is lime. It's a pure form of burnt limestone or oyster shells, depending on the source of calcium carbonate. So if you, let's say you're doing work in the Vucre or the French Quarter today, they specify the type of stucco or render or mortar. Uh, they specify the recipe that you have to use. And they'll tell you how many parts lime to how many parts Portland cement to how many parts sand you're allowed to use in your mix. Portland cement is much, much harder than lime. It also dries much faster. It's also much more brittle and tends to crack. Okay, I think that's all the questions about render for now. Great. Um, we do have, we have a few questions now about Spanish eclectic style. Okay. Um, so um, someone is asking a little bit more about sort of other geographies and cultures that this, this style might uh, reference. Um, can, you, can you speak about that a little bit? So for us, Spanish eclectic is referencing Spanish architecture, but as it's being filtered through the Western part of the United States. So you don't see buildings in Spain that necessarily look like this. That's also, we have this term eclectic in this style, specifically because we're borrowing details from the entire history of Spanish architecture, which is very broad, and then add to that in parentheses being filtered through California and the Western United States. Spanish architecture itself is really a mix of Moorish and, you know, that Northern African, um, some even parts, you know, in the Northern part of the country, things filtering in from France and Portugal. It's Spanish architecture itself is a whole, is a whole thing. So this is <laughs> this building in particular looking at this is a very southern or lo or excuse me New Orleans interpretation of a Spanish villa essentially. Great. Uh, someone else is, was, was noticing the um, brackets on this particular building seem to um, appear similar to Italianate buildings, um, which we talked about in last week's class a little bit more mm -hmm. in depth. Um, can you talk a little bit sort of about how these different styles fit together? We talked about Greek revival and Italianate revival um, last mm -hmm. week and how those fit together, but it seems like some elements might draw into this as well. Absolutely. That's a great question. So you know, n architecture is a bit like fashion. It's constantly building on itself and referencing older forms, uh, taking influences from years or decades past and bringing them back. I mean, my God, look at the 80s stuff that's suddenly back now, right? Um, and architecture does the same. So yes, this building, and that's a great point. It's got these very Italianate-like little double brackets absolutely you know it's just drawing from local examples of architecture and who knows the person the um the arch whether it was the architect or the owner who originally built this might have said man you know what i really love that new spanish style architecture that you know i've been seeing in all the pictures but oh i also really like those italianate brackets that i see in uptown so let's figure out a way to combine them and that's what they did. It's the comparisons and the similarities of how architecture develops um, and fashion tastes develop 
are very similar. Um, with regard to, to what you were just saying also, um, someone's asking a very simple question. What's the difference between a bracket and a corbel? Oh, great question. In New Orleans, we kind of use them interchangeably. A bracket is usually, but not always, is usually structural. A corbel is a small bracket. It's usually more vertical than horizontal. And a corbel is never structural. It is always decorative. Um, so these, eh, these could kind of go either way. Um, they're a little, to me, well, depends on the angle. Maybe this is the best picture. I would call this a bracket because this dimension seems to be the same as this dimension. Obviously though, these aren't structural. So you could call this a decorative bracket. Corbels are usually a good bit smaller. Great, and one more question. Um, someone is noticing the blue roof on this porch um, and would love for you to explain that. Great. Um, so yes, we have a blue ceiling on this porch. You can kind of see it through these two little arches right here. This is called Haint Blue. And I've heard two stories for this. Um, the first is that it's an Afro-Caribbean architectural element that was used to ward away spirits or keep away the bad spirits, keep them on the front porch, referencing heaven out here with our blue. Um, so there's that. I've also heard that it was simply used to keep bugs out of the house and to try to confuse the bugs that this blue ceiling is the sky and that they should try to fly up here and stay out of the house. So it's probably a combination of the two, uh, the real answer. But yes, this is called Haint Blue. And you'll find this all throughout the Gulf Coast, well into Florida, um, and really, you know, up through any kind of Gulf Coast state. It's very popular. Michelle, can you spell Haint for our audience, please? H-A-I-N-T. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna keep it moving. Ah, craftsman. Once you start to see a craftsman, this should indicate that America is turning modern. This is showing us, and let's see, you see these little details on these columns here? All of these, and up here, we are rejecting mass produced details, and we are inviting back the idea of the handmade, the craftsman who is hand making all these details. So they're special, they're custom, um, you know, handmade kind of, that being back in vogue. Uh, craftsman is also loving, you know, simpler lines, more linear elements. Love these big tapered columns on the front porch how they're skinny at the top and wider at the bottom. And um, this is again, another style coming out of California. It's relating to a furniture style that starts out in California. Um, and again, considered one of the precursors to American modern architecture. Um, emphasizing comfort over elegance here. Again, you can just, We've got more straight lines and curves. Um, anyway, Craftsman, uh, a phenomenal style, 1910 to about 1940. In New Orleans, that 1940, that's probably a little bit late. Oh, any questions? Uh, someone's asking if there are any Sears houses in New Orleans. There are. 
Um, Sears houses can be hard to spot because you, you got to get up close for one. Um, a lot of times the floor joists will actually have a stamp on them. If you're willing to crawl under a house, they'll actually have a stamp that says Sears and Roebuck. Sears houses though, you know, let's, let's see if I can, eh, no, okay, sorry. Um, Sears houses, it, it would have been a very simple, modest house form. So let's say a single shotgun. And the owner would have gone to the Sears catalog and they could have picked out their details. They could have picked out their columns, uh, their porch details, their little decorative millworks up at the top. They would order those elements through the catalog. They would come in on a railroad, pick them up, and you slap them onto the front of your house. And then suddenly your simple little shotgun could be something much more high style. So there, Sears houses are definitely in New Orleans. I've never personally worked on one, but um, you know, they are out there. So you just have to know what to, <laughs> you have to kind of get up close and personal with them to find the markings for them. Um, okay, so th this next question you might get into in a second, but I think that it's sort of, um, it's a good thing to sort of bring back um, some of the other styles to talk about also. Someone's mm -hmm. asking if craftsmen and bungalow styles get intermixed or do they form distinct architectural movements? Um, I think this is related to another question, which is sort of why do you see craftsmen features or this craftsman style on different types of houses in different types of neighborhoods where you see um, Spanish eclectic or um, uh, mission style houses on like that's a, its own sort of form and its own style. Mm -hmm. um, so can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So um, the first part of that question was craftsman versus bungalow. Um, a lot of times they are used interchangeably. Uh, the bungalow was originally a house form, meaning the the floor referencing the floor plan or how the house was built and then craftsman was the style applied to it they often went together especially because this is a style coming out of california coming out of the western part of the united states um the bungalow tended to be stretched out horizontally a bit more in new orleans we don't have that opportunity. Our lots are skinny and narrow. So we get to apply the craftsman style more like this house shows in a front porch opportunity, you know. Um, the second part of that question was asking about uh, something about mission and Spanish styles. Serena, remind Just me. sort of why you see craftsman style houses more um, sort of around the city more and on different, uh -huh. like you see crafts and features on lots of different buildings where those you were able to, you, they're in certain neighborhoods and there's, you know, a, a few examples of those houses. Yep. Uh, craftsman style was one more popular throughout the United States. Two, it's craftsman details are usually wood. They're built of millworks. And in New Orleans, most of our residences, besides the larger, grander, more high style homes, are built with siding. They're built out of wood. So um, coming back here, Spanish eclectic, it's a little hard to see, but this is stucco or render. And we talked about the stucco or render here. This is a fancier building. This is a nice little rectangle and it's got siding. So, you know, again, the craftsman could apply, could be applied a little bit more easily to those simpler buildings. All right, I'm gonna keep moving in the interest of time. Uh, ranch style. So we see these a lot. They're all over the United States. Um, this is especially getting up into Lakeview, Lake Vista, Lake Shore, Gentilly. Um, Ranch houses also, though, are still looking west for architectural inspiration. And that's why we really, excuse me, see them a lot in the further parts of the city. Um, 
because we were starting to develop neighborhoods with wider lots. Ranch houses could be developed. We have HVAC. So what does that do? How does that change our building? That shortens our ceiling height for one, because we want to keep all that cold air in. Um, but we can start to, again, kind of spread out. We don't need those porches anymore. We're not reliant on windows operating and porches creating shade to bring in cool air. We've got modern air conditioning to do it for us now. Um, ah, again, this could be its own presentation, but um, ranch houses and really anything post-World War II is bringing in some more modern building materials. The biggest one, sheetrock. And these modern building materials, sheetrock, air conditioning systems, really do shape our residential architecture from here on out. I think I end there, however. I'm gonna keep moving, because I do wanna talk about some of these other things. Okay, proper infill in historic districts. There are two approaches to how to build new construction in a historic district. New Orleans favors this approach. We could, for lack of a better term, we call this the matchy-matchy approach. New Orleans wants you to take a historic building and almost recreate it. And that's what this is. This is a recreation of a historic building and this is a new construction version of it. Elsewhere in the United States, they turn against that idea. They want you to reference historic architecture, but not match it. And that's what this photo is doing. This form is referencing Tudor revival, but it's not matching it. And in fact, we reference Tudor revival here, and then we kind of extend out and we turn it into something else over here. So again, just two different answers to the same problem. This is the version that New Orleans favors. And when I say New Orleans, I mean the permitting officials. So. Very well, actually, people. Michelle, can I, can I elaborate on that for a second? We sure. did, PRC did actually a panel discussion on infill with some of the um, architectural review committee members from the HDLC a couple months ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was really interesting. Um, so for everyone out there listening, I think that this is something that, that we would love for people to be more um, engaged and interested in sort of the concept of um, historicist infill versus contemporary infill. Um, we were able to hear from the architectural review committee members who, um, you know, they have their own personal opinions. They are architects themselves sort of about what they like and the styles and the designs that they like. It was actually really cool to hear because they, they were uh, in their personal preferences divided on sort of what, whether they like historicist infill versus uh, contemporary infill, but um, they were really talking about sort of how it meets the, the, the letter and the spirit of the regulation. So the regulations are written such that either can work, um, it sort of just depends on the, the particular circumstance, but I know that's something that a lot of people are um, curious about and have strong feelings about. Um, and so I just wanted to say sort of after having had that wonderful panel with them, um, they have really divided views about it and it's really, you know, everybody's personal sort of opinion, but they, they really do lean on sort of what, what technically is, um, is fitting versus what they personally prefer. It's, you know, they don't make decisions based on what they prefer. And I just want to make sure we, we note that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, that's great to know, you know, the, the rules of historic preservation, which are written by over here, the secretary of the interior standards really prefer this kind of approach. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that that discussion and then that, that panel happened. I will say I've had easier times getting this approach through permitting, but I'm happy to hear that both are welcome. So, and I think that gives everybody um, a better opportunity to kind of stretch their creative legs. Okay, proper additions on historic districts. So we're using our same terms. Um, over here on the left, we have our matchy-matchy approach. This is an example from New England, but I think it shows what we're talking about very well. This 
massing on the left was a building built in the 1700s. This massing on the right was an addition done in the 1980s. A passerby would be very hard pressed to be able to tell the difference between the new and the old or where the historic stopped and the new construction began. So again, the Secretary of the Interior doesn't favor this approach, especially now. This is the matchy-matchy approach. This is, it goes with it, that kind of approach over here. And this is an example that does come from New Orleans. This is in Uptown. This is a nice little traditional shotgun over here on the right. And to the left, this is their addition. Now, what is this doing right? The massing or the size is clearly referencing the old structure. We've got these nice two windows, the proportions of the top sash to the lower sash, clearly referencing top lower sash of the historic structure. But look, they've paired them differently. So this is an asymmetrical interpretation. Our roof line is a similar pitch to this one, but while this is a hip, this is a gable. So these go together, but we're not matching anything. And this is my favorite architectural term. This is called a hyphen. This little link between new and old or two separate structures is a hyphen. And that is a great way to tie an addition in to a historic building. And this is generally much preferred to preservationists than this approach on the left. Do a quick time check, okay. Um, I'm gonna walk through this one kind of quickly, how to spot additions on historic structures. In New Orleans, um, we're looking at, you know, shotgun forms here. The <laughs> most popular example, it, people love to put these little lean-tos on the back of their shotgun. That was usually adding a bathroom or a laundry room or even a kitchen sometimes. So anytime you see kind of this change in roof line or this, you know, jog out, um, that is often going to signal that you've got an addition on your historic building. Also always look at the foundation, look at the piers. You know, if you jump from brick underneath one part of the structure to cinder block or CMU under another part of the structure, that's signaling an addition. Um, go over here to our list, different types of windows, doors, sill heights, wall cladding materials, et cetera. There are a ton of ways to spot additions on a historic buildings. We could really do a whole class on this, but um, if you just, if you're only looking at the exterior of the building, look at roof lines and foundations first. Okay. All right, um, time for a little, la little la lanyard. Some fun words and terms to use correctly now that you are a historic house specialist. This list just purely comes from um, some of my experience and some of my pet peeves. So masonry. Masonry includes brick, stone, cinder block, et cetera. If you're discussing a brick building, call it brick. Uh, a shotgun and a center hall, those are not architectural styles. Those are forms. Likewise, Victorian is not an architectural style. It refers to a time period. Oh, this is my favorite. Um, historic versus historical. When you're talking about old buildings, 99% of the time, you want to use the word historic. There is no such thing as historical preservation. It is historic preservation. Neighborhoods and architecture are historic. Many popular books are historical fiction. The only example of historical architecture I can think of would be the Disney castle in Orlando. It's not actually old, it's just referencing something old. Ah, here, someone asked this earlier, a bracket is usually gonna be structural. It's larger than a corbel. A brace is a type of bracket that is always structural. 
a brace is usually just that kind of L shaped or even a little triangle shaped, very simple looking bracket. Uh, we talked about corbels and we talked about hyphens. Okay, some street names. Elysian Fields. Elysian means heavenly of the gods. But the reason why Elysian Fields is such a wide street is that it originally had an open sewage pit running through its neutral ground. Um, Elysian Fields is an old street, but it was considered to be on the outskirts of town. And unfortunately, that was where our, our big sewage lines existed. Uh, was Canal Street ever a canal? No. It was named that, and it was originally drawn to show a waterway or a canal, but it was never actually built that way. Um, I get this one a lot. What does Chapatulis really mean? Uh, this has a great story. I, I once went to a class with a, um, a linguist professor, and apparently, and then I learned this from him, Ula, the last part of this word, means people of, and the front part of the word, the chop, means up there around the corner a bit. Just kind of means over there. So this chapatulis just means the people from up there around the corner a bit. It was not, as many people will tell you, the name of a Native American tribe. Um, I think we talked about this, the gardens of the lower garden district and garden district. Um, people assume that that is solely referencing the fact that the properties themselves were ex expansive and included very pretty and lush English gardens. But um, research shows that that name garden actually comes from an older source from when one of our city's founders, Bienville, had a plantation in most of Uptown. And because he wasn't allowed technically by the French government to have a plantation as a city founder, he called it his vegetable garden. So that's where the name garden comes from. And I think that's it. I'm sure- Thank you, Michelle. Uh, yeah. I just wanna note, it, so I know it's, it's a little bit after three, um, my apologies for running a little bit late. We do have a few more questions. So for those of you that need to go, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, for anyone who wants to stick around, I think we've got a time for a couple more questions with Michelle. Um, but again, thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, thank you again to the wonderful members of the Preservation Resource Center. We love you guys. Thank you for making this possible. Um, for anyone who wants to become a member, please go to prcno.org. Um, you can be, become a member, buy our book. Um, like I said, um, you can, if you become a member, you'll get our amazing magazine, Preservation in Print, delivered to your door. Um, and that is a wonderful resource on more information about historic architecture, historic neighborhoods, interesting projects going on around town. So please, please, please consider joining. Um, and if you ever have any questions about anything, please feel free to email me. My email is s. M-O-H-A-N at P-R-C-N-O dot org. So hopefully we'll see you guys soon. If you have ideas for other classes you'd love to attend, let me know. Um, and we will see you soon. Um, but we're going to get to a couple more questions now. Um, so Michelle, we've got a bunch of other questions that I want to just go back to. Um, starting with Sorry, so with Craftsman Houses, actually, someone said they've noticed a detail in the fascia boards. Um, sorry, I think jumped around. The fascia boards uh, where there are voids milled out of the boards that resulted in elongated ovals. Can you comment on this detail? Yes, so this particular picture doesn't have it, but um, I believe what this, this uh, person's asking. So this board, this fascia board, you see a little bit here. Imagine if this cutout were extended, cut out here, 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 and all along that board. Um, very common detail. You see it a lot on um, more modest craftsman houses, you know, where that 
that and maybe some tapered columns might be the only really calling cards of the style. Uh, <laughs> I will say too, a lot of those have probably been replaced or repaired poorly because a piece of wood that has a bunch of holes in it over a hundred years, you know, can rot um, and not hold up as well as a solid piece. So yes, you'll see that a lot in New Orleans. Um, and it is a great little detail. Great. Someone is saying that board is known as the rake. Uh, that is not a term that I know, but um, I just, that's good to know. Great. Um, <laughs> okay. So um, a couple of people are asking questions from stuff from last week, actually. So um, okay. do we have a second to get into that stuff also? Sure. sure. Um, someone's asking about um, old glass in the garden district. And then this is something that we talked about last week. Um, but someone in the audience um, wanted to, to hear a little bit more about this. Uh, we talked about the history of the Garden District and how um, the uh, Washington Avenue dividing line was sort of um, what that means for sort of the old Garden District and the history of the neighborhood. Can you reiterate that um, for folks that may have missed that? And I'm going to get uh, some of the questions on the architecture from today uh, back into a good order to ask you those while you fill us in on those things again. Sure. Uh, let me see. Uh, I don't think I have any great pictures of old glass. Let me do a quick, yeah. no, not really. Um, glass is a building material. It changed. Uh, we'll sit on this one. It's as good as any. Um, as a building material, you know, the oldest forms of glass, we could only make in very, very little teeny tiny sizes. Uh, it was very brittle. This was due to how it was being poured. Um, glass was originally blown, you know, and made, made in a circular format. Um, as, you know, glass techniques get more advanced and we're able to heat them up more, heat the glass or, you know, the sand, heat the sand more consistently to create larger panes of glass. Um, we're able to create larger window panes. So, you know, here getting a little bigger and let's see, there you've got, you know, a one over one happening. So glass is a phenomenal building material. And we talked a little bit today about stained glass versus art glass. But I think probably what you're thinking of is the old wavy glass that you see in the garden district. And the waves in the glass come from it being heated and cooled inconsistently. And that's where you get those, it's really just inconsistencies in the glass itself. If for some reason you are to break one of those panes of glass, you have two options. You can go buy salvage glass, which is very expensive, but you can find it. There's also a glass works place on the North Shore. I think it's called Covington Glass. And they make replica wavy glass. So uh, I hope that's answering your question. Oh, and then Serena, what was the other part? Garden District and um, Lafayette? Yep. Yeah. Or Washington Avenue, that's right. Washington um, Avenue and the, yes. the, um, the history of the Garden District um, as it relates to that. Yes. So on Washington Avenue, um, and I think I said this last time, Washington Avenue includes a cemetery, Lafayette number one. It's across from Commander's Palace. Anytime you see cemeteries, that should usually indicate, okay, this was, a, this was originally an outskirts or this is a dividing line of some kind between maybe two parishes or two towns. Cemeteries usually indicated some kind of beginning and end. So Washington Avenue originally um, signaled a change from the city of New Orleans going towards the French Quarter and the city of Lafayette. Uh, New Orleans eventually incorporates the city of Lafayette, not the Lafayette that's way out west. This was the little town of Lafayette that surrounded um, 
essentially that commander's palace area. So um, that's why Lafayette Cemetery is so named. It's because it was part of the town of Lafayette. So yeah, the garden district grows that way as the city of New Orleans um, absorbs it. Great, thank you. Um, so, okay, so one of the questions is about lot size um, or sort of lot uh, dimensions. You had mentioned that there are narrow lots and um, then when you showed the ranch slide, obviously that's a wide, um, a wide, a widely situated um, yep. house. Um, can you provide any thoughts about sort of why there were narrow lots in older neighborhoods and then wider lots later in uh, newer developed neighborhoods? Sure. So uh, the narrow lots, which are usually going to be about 30 feet across by about 100 to 120 feet deep, um, those are coming in the older parts of the city. And again, the older parts of the city were developed from old plantations. The plantations themselves were very long and narrow. They had a little bit of river access, and then they would kind of bell out like a very skinny piece of pie. And as each plantation owner would sell off their plantations and have them subdivided by surveyors, they were trying to sell as much land, as many plot or as many lots as they could. So they had long skinny parcels of land. So it made sense that that kind of became, that translated into our urban um, fabric. So once we get up to Lake Vista, Lakeview, Lakeshore, and newer parts of the city that were really developed, you know, after the wars with the help of the automobile, we could kind of rewrite the script, right? Where we've got new surveyors laying out plots and streets and we can get some wider lots up there. Great, thank you. Um, and sorry, so back to craftsmen, Someone's, someone would like you to um, comment or reiterate a little bit more. They, they sort of, they, they had heard that craftsmen's came about because you could, like you couldn't go to a store and buy cabinets. You had to, you had to hire a craftsman to build the house. Um, it's not necessarily a rejection of pre-built materials. Um, I feel like I mean, it might be sort of the same, but can you can you sort of elaborate on that a little bit or clarify that a little bit? Sure. So it's not that you couldn't go buy manufactured goods at this time. It's just that it was unpopular, really. And again, Craftsman is coming out of really more of a furniture style. The cab You spoke about the cabinetry. And that's right. You know, you... Um, people were suddenly taking an interest in this kind of handmade cabinetry, handmade furniture, and then that grows into a much bigger architectural movement. Um, I mean, really, you know, it's not that any of this couldn't be stock millwork. It's just that it was suddenly unpopular to have it be stock. You wanted it to have that very handmade look um you know we're it's we're rejecting let's see if i can find it this rejecting the idea of this which is you know a lot of times bought from a catalog or just stock millworks that you could buy from anywhere Great. Um, okay, so I have I have two more questions for you. Um, one is uh, and there and one one short and one's really big. So I'm going to go with the short one first, and then we can sort of figure out the big one from there. The short one is: Can you recommend your favorite um, resource on historic architectural types and styles? Yeah. So um, my favorite book, which covers the whole United States, is a field guide to American houses. It's by Virginia McAllister. 
a fabulous resource. It breaks down windows, doors, roof lines, all the different styles. It's a great resource to have. For New Orleans architecture in particular, um, the New Orleans architecture series, which you can actually buy through the Preservation Resource Center, they come in volumes. I think there's five volumes total. They go neighborhood by neighborhood, and they really do a great job of getting into the history of the neighborhoods. Um, they talk about, you know, why certain architecture exists where it does. Uh, those are much more in depth. They're by Mary Louise Kristovich and Rolak Toledano. So New Orleans architecture series, five volumes, and then a field guide to American houses by Virginia McAllister. Thank you. Okay, so now this, this is a bigger question. Okay. Uh, we don't need to get, this could be a dissertation. So, so <laughs> we just wanna hear your thoughts on this. Someone is, is um, asking about um, protections on the interiors of historic houses. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got certain mechanisms in place to, um, to protect historic buildings. We've got the historic landmarks, uh, the HDLC, sorry, um, that regulates certain structures in certain areas and in, you know, in controlled districts, but that still doesn't control anything about what happens on the interior of structures. Are there any, um, any protections in place for the interiors of, of structures um, or are there any um, that maybe could be put in place or that are in place in, uh, in other areas of the country that you um, find particularly interesting? So in New Orleans and in other parts of the country, if you are a certain type of landmark, meaning the building is an individually, or excuse me, an individual national or state landmark, a lot of times, not always, but most times, the interior is also protected. So you know, Abraham Lincoln's cottage, the interior of that is protected. There's stuff, excuse me, several plantation homes on River Road where the interiors are protected here. Um, you've got to be a pretty major individual landmark where the interior is protected. Now, if you are pursuing a historic tax credit at either the state or federal level, then suddenly your interior and the preservation of your interior is subject to review by preservationists. So by nature of using a historic tax credit, the interior becomes more or less protected. Now, using a tax credit, you can still introduce air conditioning. You can put in a modern kitchen, update the plumbing, electrical, et cetera. But locations of walls, doors, casings, even floor materials, that will be protected under the rules of a tax credit. Great, thank you. Um, I think that is just about everything. One quick question, uh, just before we go, someone's asking the blue house on St. Charles that you showed um, in last week and sort of just showed when you were skipping through before. Can you just reiterate what style that is before we go? Ah, yes, yeah. so a, a Victorian period, not Victorian style, Victorian period, and that is a Queen Anne. Thank you. Um, does, if anyone, I, I think that's all, I think we've gotten to all of the questions. If I've missed anything, please, please email us, email me, let me know, I can find the answer for you. I can either try to remember what Michelle has said or we can get in touch with Michelle and um, provide the information to you. So I apologize if we've missed anything. Um, again, please tune in, we're gonna be doing more of these um, on a variety of different topics. So check our um, uh, social media for, for the Preservation Resource Center. Go to prcno.org and you can find out about all the classes that we will have coming up. And we're open to suggestions. So get in touch with me if there's something you really want to learn about. Um, thank you all so much. And I will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Michelle. Thank you.